Welcome to A Photographer's Life. The channel that takes you behind the curtain into the world of professional architectural photography. Join us now for an episode with one of America's premier architectural photographers. Today's broadcast comes from a recent interview with award-winning American architectural photographer Brian Dressler. Today's interview was conducted by AIAP director Alan Blakely. We hope you enjoy the show. If you do, please let us know by liking this episode and subscribing to this channel. Now, on with the show. Okay, we want to welcome everyone to this uh, broadcast of A Photographer's Life. We're here today with Brian Dressler from Columbia, South Carolina. Brian's a veteran photographer who's been in the business for a long time and uh, has quite a reputation around the country uh, as one of the elite <laughs> architectural <laughs> photographers. And so we're, we're pleased to have him here with us today. And uh, Brian, thank you for joining us and uh, taking the time to talk a little bit about your career and, and your business. Happy to do so. Thank you so much, Alan, for having me. I'm, uh, this is my first time being interviewed, so I hope it's not too boring <laughs> for people. And uh, you're, you're right in saying that uh, it's been a long path. <laughs> I'm in my 42nd year, uh, self-employed, and um, go ahead and fire away. I'll be happy to Okay. See if can adequately. That's an excellent career to talk about because there's not too many people that survive that long in the <laughs> photography business. And so you, you've obviously made some good choices along the way. What, what was it that first interested you in photography? How did you become interested in photography? Well, um, it's kind of in my blood in that my father was a producer at NBC in Chicago. Okay. It, and always been around TV, radio, video production, uh, and music. And when he took a job down here, when I moved down from Chicago to Columbia, South Carolina, way back in 1974, I okay. was in my senior year of high school, and I had to uh, think about what I would do with my life. And I had always been interested in film, photography, and music. And uh, I was lucky enough to fall into a program that was at that time at the University of South Carolina, starting in 74 and I finished in 79. Uh, they had a program called Media Arts, which was uh, basically using all the different mediums in non-traditional, non-broadcast formats. Oh, interesting. So, uh, yeah, instead of journalism and being published, mm -hmm as a photographer or a writer or a reporter or a right. television news reporter, whatever, we were using media as different art form tools. And it was fascinating. It was one, one of the um, you know, groundbreaking areas of using mediums um, in terms of a, a way to study it for a four year degree. Uh, it's called media arts and um, it was very well rounded. And what happened was I, um, I decided to go into, uh, I hadn't made a decision whether it was photography or music or film or animation or any of the different mediums um, mm -hmm. until I was enrolled in a, um, you know, obligated to take a photography 101 class. Oh, okay. And it just so happened that um, a very dear friend to this day was my mentor, my teacher, and I went on to just fall in love as he introduced us in the first class was the power of a still image. And I learned composition and I learned so much from my mentor, Bob Rowan, who is uh, a very good friend to this day and lives and works uh, outside of uh, Tacoma, Washington. So oh, interesting. I, I, I was just really blessed to have a mentor that uh, touched me in so many ways. That's great. Um, was architecture on the radar at that point for you? As far as you know what? Uh, I, <laughs> not at that point. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I uh, put myself through school waiting tables. Okay. So for four years, 1975 through 79, um, I was waiting tables at night, working out of a duplex, living in a duplex, and ended up uh, 
processing black and white film in the walk-in dark room in my, my apartment every oh, night wow. af after work. Uh, a okay. Shift at later. <laughs> and um, I ended up doing so much outside freelance that I had to get a business license. <laughs> <laughs> So um, that's, not, that's not a bad problem. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I was just busy all the time and excited to be doing things, you know, for myself and 100 percent responsible for myself. And um, then I got married and I was within four years responsible for three more people. Okay. <laughs> so I basically was thrown into a um, obligation of, mm -hmm. uh, of having to support my family and the um, self-employment uh, freelance photography thing was really falling right into place for me. And I was just lucky. So to get to the architectural question, I'll say mm -hmm. that I think I photographed a total of four weddings in those early days. Okay. Hated every minute of it uh, <laughs> in terms of the responsibility. <laughs> uh, did a okay job because I was asked to do more and more, but I said, no, no, it's too much pressure. So I found a love in architecture, uh, architectural photography in that I like things that didn't move. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been a sports or action photographer. I'm not okay. good at it at all. And um, I just really love architecture. So uh, for a long time, I've been focused on that. Mm -hmm. And also uh, some scenic skylines of the city in my early career that really made a, a little bit of a name for myself in terms of producing some really nice uh, oh, scenic okay. views of our city and kind of oh, got my name out there a little bit. Okay. So you were self-employed from the start then, it sounds yeah. like. Okay. <laughs> 79 until hopefully tomorrow too. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, what was the makeup of your business early on? What kind of jobs were you shooting that uh, you know, other than weddings? <laughs> early on, it was it was you know black and white and and producing uh, print images back in analog okay. days forever, doing everything myself, mm -hmm. uh, which progressed to uh, doing e six processing. Uh, oh, okay. In, in my own studio. Um, since 1996, I've owned my own building and made a big addition to it. And uh, for a lot of years, I was doing big product illustration. Uh, okay. But I always felt myself drawn to uh, the architectural work, which I love more than anything. But the product illustration, because I had a large studio, was really, you know, substantial for me in terms of carrying the weight of the mortgage, et cetera. So okay. I did a lot of product illustration. And of course, in a small market, I'm doing corporate work, uh, oh, yeah. some, some advertising work, mm -hmm. um, and architecture was always my fave. So, okay, yeah. Interesting. Uh, Has your studio work kind of uh, diminished over the years uh, in favor of architecture, or you're still keeping a balance between those two? Well, I mean, Let's, uh, I, I kind of, I'm asked that, how has it gone? And when I look back, I, I saw the writing on the wall for product illustration um, not being as lucrative uh, mm -hmm. as things went on. And the reason is, um, darn near every product is uh, created on a CAD system for designing the product. And once you have that CAD file and you can mm -hmm. import it to Photoshop and create your key light and your shadows and put any background in it, that's when that product illustration photography took a deep dive. I right. still do some of it for, for people that have unique products, uh, especially there's a pharmaceutical company uh, that's always coming out with pre, um, new products here in, in Columbia, South Carolina. And they'll call me up and, and need something tomorrow. Oh, um, yes, sure. To, yeah. So, I mean, I'm still doing that, but it is, I mean, it's off by 80%, 90% from what okay. it was. Okay. Interesting. You you started out in a, in a film world, 
uh, shooting film. Were you, were you shooting four by five transparencies? I'm guessing on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was it was crazy. I mean, we I'd load up, you know, holders after holders and keep them in a little cooler for the the trip. Uh, summer times are pretty nasty and hot in South Carolina, and you know, I'd keep the film cool until I needed to shoot and. Um, you know, get a stack of holders this big just to do one view. And I was doing multiple exposures in there with uh, mm. different light sources and filtering yeah. uh, spot for the different light sources to combine them on one sheet of film. And then, of course, doing the bracketing of exposures. And then I got wise to uh, pushing and pulling film to help me because I got it narrowed down so far to uh, uh, nailing the exposure that... Um, we could run, you know, 10 sheets of film and run the first first print, first mm -hmm. uh, E to V6, and then push or pull the rest. Um, so it was, um, it was a, a constantly fine tuning and um, had E6 processing with a Jobo processor here in my studio. Okay. And had a full-time uh, associate that worked with me for over 20 years. Yeah. And was instrumental in, you know, processing film and, you know, in the hybrid time, we would shoot film and then put it on a light table and shoot with a small little digital Fuji camera, like a copy stand situation okay. on the light table to show the client four different views of transparencies. Sure. Okay. And Interesting. That, and then when we got their image order, I would, uh, I purchased a uh, uh, Emicon Flex scanner. Okay. We would scan very high resolution, the four by five, and then do Photoshop retouching on it. And that hybrid situation, I mean, let's just say quality digital came into its own just at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> The, the clock has been ticking on my age and it was just, you know, it was, I was starting to lose a little bit of the fun. The magic was always there with, processing analog and everything and it's still there it's just yeah i can't afford the time to do it yeah it's a, it was an amazing process i mean i just to learn the technique of taking that four by five holder and tapping it down before you inserted it into the 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 scenar back to right. get that film to seat mm -hmm. and to hear uh professionals telling me uh, that, you know, once you take that dark slide out, you know, now it's getting exposed to air and if it's more humid or whatever, all of a sudden in that chamber, you can get the film to buckle a little bit and that might be a cause. So, you know, duplicate, 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 yeah. same thing. And, you know, when we process that first sheet, right on the, you know, at normal processing, if mm -hmm. we're lucky enough to not have a bend or a wave or a humidity defection in it, then, um, you know, we wouldn't even, we'd process the other ones straight away and and just have them as backups and use it for portfolio or whatever. Because yeah. those were a lot of the days where we had to d deliver original film as oh, well. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at what point in time did you make the transition to digital? You know, I got, um, like I said, I had that teeny little Fuji film camera that was mm -hmm. a, a little cube that I set up as a copy stand, and that was just for recording the four mm -hmm. sheets of film or the two and a quarter transparencies in a whole full file, full, um, file folio sleeve, you know, a transparency yeah. uh, right on a light table. So mm -hmm. that was digital just for getting the images to the client to make a selection. Mm -hmm. And then I think I bought, um, I think the Nikon, the first Nikon, uh, excuse me, the first uh, Kodak camera that was really, you know, hitting the mark was the greatest thing ever. And it was, you know, super expensive. And I never, never <laughs> bit that bullet, but I waited for it to come around enough to where I, I and I'm forgetting the numbers of the, the first decent Nikon that came out, um, but I immediately went to a, uh, a Creo uh, back uh, for two and a quarter and okay. used, used the Fuji, Fuji camera that had rise and fall, tilt and shift 
for oh, the 680 I, or six, yeah 680 so I, it was using the um medium format mm -hmm. and i bought, had the creo back uh Emicon back, I think it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and was shooting medium format like crazy, yeah. uh, which was great because I could get, what, like six nice big exposures on on 220 film or 120 film. I forget. <laughs> but it's a yeah. great way to go shooting medium format with mm -hmm. the rise and fall and shift and a variety of lenses. So for years I had that and it was so much faster than 4 by 5 So I kind oh, of yeah. transitioned from four by five to two and a quarter um, uh, 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 digital mm -hmm. and shot that for a long time. And then I got, um, I forget which Nikon, but now I'm on the, I, I have the D810 and I shoot all my architectural on the D850. And okay. I just, you know, I think all that extra bit depth and everything is great on those super duper expensive backs and those, <laughs> I, I mean, it'd be great. I just don't, I just don't see in my work, uh, I've had very satisfied clients, even in that 35 millimeter full frame format of digital. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I just got, um, uh, a print order and we print in-house uh, for an eight foot wide uh, panorama shot of the city oh, okay. for display in somebody's office. Now, granted wow. it was so many exposures because I, uh, it wasn't a stitched panorama, but it was uh, many layers due to the fact that I was shooting over a period of time. Okay so that I had detail from the daylight, late afternoon detail, mm -hmm. the trees in the foreground of the oh, nice. skyline. And then I shot through rush hour with, you know, a little bit of movement with the, the cars and everything. And then yeah. I, I keep the camera set up and, and, and wait until it's pitch black out and then do a nice long exposure to expose the office lights uh, mm -hmm. of all the buildings. So, um, it is many layers of exposures, and the native file ends up being about, uh, I believe, like 800 and something megabytes or whatever. So the native <laughs> file um, processed through the native file is 96 inches wide. Okay. So it's going to, I don't have to res it up, and oh, nice. I won't be reducing it, and we're going to output an eight-foot print, and I've done many of them, and it's wonderful to have all that control and everything in house. I just go out of house for the mounting of the print, oh, and okay. so it's a it's a great system to have that color control. I, I'm assuming that you're in, using the tilt shift lenses. Yeah, that's predominantly uh, my main go to is either 35 PC or 24 PC or mm -hmm. 85 PC, and I haven't you know, invested in the 17 PC NICOR yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's such a knee jerk reaction to pick your widest lens and go into an interior and, you know, set up camp in the corner so you can shoot the widest thing and show it all. But yeah, you see that I'm, a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm a firm believer in picture can represent a portion of the whole thing so you don't have to show everything keep it you know let it represent now obviously we're trying to show the features of the room and blah 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 but that does not necessarily mean always jump in the corner with the widest lens exactly yeah. etc so let a portion speak for the whole the other thing that has been absolutely key to the way I approach an interior or exterior for that matter, uh, a photographer uh, in Denver, one of my father's friends who had huge accounts uh, over the years and I uh, got to spend some time with him. He said, Brian, you know, think about the way you're, you look, you know, what your eye sees. Now, obviously we do have some peripheral vision, mm -hmm. but you, you look in a normal way. You don't look in a telephoto way and you don't look in a wide angle way. 
you look right. in and that's why the 50 or 55 millimeter on 35 millimeter yeah. format is the normal lens. He said, and I'll never forget it because I try and do it all the time. The, the closer you can uh, achieve a normal view is what makes it easiest for the viewer to relate to. That's pretty because powerful. Everybody sees in a normal view. Right. So yeah, it's cool to go wide. It's cool to go <laughs> tell a photo. But think about what people can relate to. Mm -hmm. They see the world just as you do in terms of height to width ratio and you know a normal perspective. So if you can do that with your interiors, exteriors, people can relate to it easier instead of this whiz bang overextended, you yeah. know canopy over your head sure the architect loves it but strive and i always do i strive to get it the longer the lens i can use the better to get away from that 24 even mm -hmm. though it's the one i use all the time <laughs> most of yeah, the time mostly I yeah there may not be much choice on some situations but. exactly exactly but if i can go to the 35 and just back up a little bit to include yeah. what i need to include in the scene i do you know, I don't just stick with the 24. So I'm always trying to get to that more normal lens. I, I think that's that's great advice. That's something that I've heard from uh, some other experienced photographers too, who, uh, yeah. you know, have been at this. And, and those are the shots that, for me anyway, become those uh, those definitive shots of a building. It's not the big you know, wide shot. It, it's it's the, the shot that looks like what your eye would see. Um, I think that's really powerful. It's kind of counterintuitive to what is being generally done. And I'm afraid what might be generally taught <laughs> in photography. Yeah. Um, well, so I know that a lot of, uh, a, a lot of architectural photographers uh, in these times, mm -hmm a hot real estate market during COVID and 3%, you know, mortgage rates. Yeah. There's a whole lot of real estate getting moved around and you can't shoot for real estate without showing most or all of the interior. You basically have to show them. Mm -hmm. So I, that's, you know, that's a, 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 a segment of architectural photography that I've never excelled at or pursued. Mm -hmm. um, I've always <clears throat> been commissioned by the architect first and uh, will also do multi-party cost share with other interested parties, engineering yeah. firm, um, landscape architect, uh, contractor, and owner. So mm -hmm. that's typical or interior design if, if they had a separate design firm for the interior. So that's always been my market and it usually starts with the architect. So yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, well away from the uh, side of the business that deals with um, real estate, especially mm -hmm. residential. I've, I've done a yeah. love shooting uh, large homes at the coast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> South Carolina, sure, and uh, large homes wherever they may be, um, and I love it. I love doing residential. It's just that it's hard to get people to really uh, come off the hip, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, pricing wise, to pay for what I'm bringing to the table. Yeah. Uh, now, when it's a multi-million dollar house and they're having it photographed so that they can market it, that gets into a little bit different. Uh, category than just mm -hmm. your everyday uh, show show these kitchen bathrooms dens and uh, foyers you know is wide right. wide 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 right <laughs> so it's it's just not my cup of tea so um, mm -hmm. hats off to those who are doing well in this uh, active real estate market times well it seems to be um, a pretty amazing market right now for the people that have decided to concentrate that but i think 
I think what you said uh, about the differentiation between the two disciplines is is important because they are two really different approaches to photography and they don't cross over very well <laughs> generally. So, uh, and, the, and then the difference in, in fee structure is significant. So uh, it seems like photographers that, like yourself, they're, they're being paid for their talent. Um, I mean, somebody hires you because they know the type of photography that Brian does. Uh, not, he's, he's the most affordable in this market kind of situation. Yeah. Right. That's exactly it. And that's what I've always, I'm, you know, if I get an inquiry from a new potential client, I, all, I tell them right off the bat, you can find it for cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you don't have to look far either. You know, you trying to fill a hole or were you looking at my portfolio and really want what I bring to the table? Mm -hmm. If so, then we can, you know, continue the conversation. Otherwise, you know, you know, I love you, but, and thanks for calling, but, um, <laughs> it, you know, the, the, I, I did learn a long time ago, the most powerful word in the English language is no. <laughs> and you don't have to be snide, ugly about it. It's just no. when it comes, comes to push and pull and compromising fees and stuff, sometimes you have to just say, I, I think you ought to look elsewhere or, you know, thank you very much, but no. Yeah. And I think and that's powerful. Yeah. You know, it's powerful in several, several aspects because it also teaches the, you know, you're educating the client or the potential client at that point that uh, there's a reason for this costing more with you. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and that reason is, is tangible and, it, and it's, you know, they're going to see that in the, in the end product. We, you brought up licensing and multi-party licensing in, uh, or earlier on in our conversation. How much of, uh, of your income, or, or can you even quantify it, but is that, is that a significant portion of income, uh, multi-party licensing? Yeah, it is. And I, it seems to be more and more popular over the last, I guess, say, five, eight years. I've promoted it. Mm -hmm. uh, not only do I make more money, but it makes it more affordable for the initial client, which sure. is typically the architect. So mm -hmm. I will ask that architect, you know, are there any other uh, parties that may be interested in going in on a cost share? Mm -hmm. I never, it's never splitting costs. Right. It's always <laughs> a cost share. And I'll be happy to, to share the, the formula with anybody because I share it with my clients. Mm -hmm. It's a simple formula that, and some people think it's great. Some people think it's way too low. Some people think that it's too costly and their multiple parties won't afford it, but I'm happy to share it. Um, I can use an example just because it'll be easy to do the math. Mm -hmm. But let's say you had an assignment that you were going to get. I don't have day rates. Okay. I don't have half day rates. Mm -hmm. Every project is unique. Okay. But let's just say that it's going to take, there won't be anything else I can schedule during that day. Sure. <laughs> so I have to plan on a day of my time. Right. It's not a day rate. And let's just say that my fee for one party, let's just use an example of $2,000. Okay. And then the architect says, well, the contractor has shown some interest. Mm -hmm. How much will it be? So the formula is really easy. You take your initial creative fee, and then for every party additionally that's interested, you add 50% to it and then divide by the total number of parties. So if you got 2000 and you add one party, that's 3000, you divide by two, each party pays 1500. But I do have to say that the, um, all of the expenses are straight up divided by the number of parties. Okay. So you got, you know, production cost, um, 
assistance fees, you got mileage, you got every, you know, everything that goes into it. All that's divided straight up by the number of parties, but the creative fee portion is you take the year initial of what you would charge mm -hmm. for one, and then you get a second party on board. You take half of that, add it to it, and then divide by two. And I've done That's a an easy bunch formula. of them. Yeah, I've done a bunch of them, five party cost year. Mm -hmm. And here's the key too. That's only if we can get them on board on the front end. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no cherry pick. If they want to cherry pick after the end, and that's fine, but they're yeah. going to pay more per image. Sure. Yeah. And, um, you know, I also have a per image charge after the fact. Um, mm -hmm. Usually when I figure the estimate for the architect, and let's say we got a contractor involved in an engineering firm, mm -hmm. everyone has different priorities. Right. So I'm going to try and cover them all. Mm -hmm. but then they're going to want to cherry pick which images they want optimized and delivered, okay. which is fine with me because mm -hmm. that's on top of the fee, the creative the fee, fee okay. and the other expenses. So everyone's on their own when they do, when they actually order the images. I see. Okay. Selections. So they can cut, so they, they customize that, that order yeah. then after the fact. Okay. Right, so there's a per image charge and it depends on what the image is and how complex and whatever to figure in my you know, Photoshop time, et cetera. Sure. But the other key thing to it is that um, each party signs off on the estimate, which is geared to one party, two party, three parties or five mm -hmm. with the math all, already done. Mm -hmm. And each party is billed invoiced and licensed separately okay that makes None sense this crap where you're going to put the burden on the architect to go collect the money from the, yeah from the contractor or the you know engineering firm and then reimburse you well who gets the license because the engineer took picked out different pictures than the architect did who picked out different pictures than the contractor did so everybody is invoiced separately Everybody is licensed separately. Mm -hmm. And then everything gets registered with the US copyright office. Exactly. <laughs> That's the important caveat at the end. <laughs> Let's talk about my career. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assume that you you had some bad experiences. Oh yeah. But it didn't take me long to realize I should be registering my work. Mm -hmm. And I've been registering my work for more than 20 years. Okay. And it hasn't been until about the last five that all those fees for registration, the time and trouble mm -hmm. it took to organize and everything. And I mean to tell you, I am so fortunate. <laughs> it has paid for itself. Yeah. In these troubling times, I had my best year ever last year. That's great. That's I'm hearing. I'm hearing that from other people as well. Um, yeah, all all it takes is uh, is one uh, situation where you have to recover damages <laughs> to pay for all of that trouble. Um, and I've had a few of those, so um, I can relate to that. Yeah, everyone gets ripped off, and I still mm -hmm. get ripped off but the ones i find i i tell them you know you really need to pay for this and i try and do it the nice way on the front end and like and i just can't emphasize enough how important it is to register your work and for guys that are you know you got to have a system yes exactly get a system number your images give them a number not a name my image numbering system is so simple i can put my finger on an image you know 10 12 15 years ago because it's got a number. It really works out great. And that's what's delivered to the client. It's what's on the invoice. It's what's on the license. It's what's registered with the copyright office. It's what's in my um, my client folder on the, on the computer. And as far as the metadata that you embed, I'm assuming that you that you've got copyright declarations and you're you're 
you're filling up that metadata availability with to, everything. To be you honest need. with you, all I do, all I do is uh, C circle with the year in my name. So I do not get involved in metadata with specifying how they can use it, blah, blah. Okay. That, that's okay. in the license. I'm going to do that one time. Has, has licensing become easier over the years or harder? Or have you seen it change at all from when you started or um, as far as enforcing licensing? Yeah, it has definitely uh, changed. Um, back in the... 80s, it was more of an awareness thing to clients, mm -hmm. meaning they hadn't heard of what do you mean? I'm paying you for a job, I can do anything with I want. Exactly. I said, Well, you know, I can I can structure your license so that you can use it for the things you want. Mm -hmm. The key words in my licensing licensing uh, are non-transferable yeah okay? that's the most important so, <laughs> in general for architects and people that commission me to do work whether it's single party multi-party whatever each one gets a license with the exact image numbers that they've ordered right okay the language that the license is for unlimited non-transferable usage to the original client only. So if I got an invoice slash license made out to the architect, he is an original client. It's a non-transferable license, but mm -hmm. they, architectural firm can do anything they want, you know, competitions or uh, um, sure. let them, they don't use it for advertising much except for online. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not really, Architects generally don't uh, spend money on print ads. Right. And if they do, that's okay with me. I mean, I don't get nitpicking uh, that far. A lot of guys will not allow them to use it for paid advertising. I, I, I really, I draw the line somewhere. Yeah. And yeah. I'm happy for them to use it any way they want for their company in perpetuity. Mm-hmm. Okay, that, that's good to know. Um, I think I think a lot of arch architectural photographers are on the same page that way. Everything's based on the potential number of impressions the image will make. Or Thank you. That's that's a that's a that's a great way to understand it. I appreciate yeah. that. Are, are you now where you thought you'd be forty years ago? Wow, what a question! <laughs> um, obviously, didn't see COVID coming. <laughs> Did not see the deep dive on uh, corporate work. No, I'm not. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I see that the ease of digital capture and quality capture from even a cell phone is fine in the right hands. Mm -hmm. And now you can even process, They've, I think, uh, Apple came out with a phone that has a uh, capability of shooting raw, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. Um, but everyone's so used to taking a, a shot and then just using it. Uh, so many marketing directors and I mean, their their budgets have just dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. And, you know, it comes back to what I learned a long time ago when negotiating uh, with a, an art director or a marketing person is that you know, they were in the position of trying to get it as cheap as possible for their client. Right. And I'm saying, well, wait a second. You know, the farther down we go, that's going to send a message to the client that they don't need as much money in their budget for next year. Good point. <laughs> and it's a downward cycle that does not end. And now mm -hmm. that they've all got cell phones, just shoot it yourself. It's good enough. And as a society, most people, in my opinion, have a much lower uh, mentality of recognizing quality than they used to. I would agree. And 
I think photography, when you and I started in this business in the late 70s, was probably perceived as a craft um, as well as a profession. And it's something that you you took time to learn and you needed a talent for. <laughs> and uh, technology seems to have supplanted part of that. And not entirely, but uh, I, I always try to make the point that I think talent is still the best competitive advantage. <laughs> so, and uh, it gives you the best longevity. If you were to uh, advise somebody and mentor somebody at this point who was looking at jumping into the architectural photography world, what, what kinds of things do you think would be important for them to, to know and understand? I would, you know, I would say study the masters, study, you know, what's been done and what made them unique. Um, whether it's, you know, scenic shots from Ansel Adams or what's really considered, you know, the, the top end of the work. And um, I would study that. And then, you know, podcast, YouTube, all that stuff's next to free or free and you yeah. can do it all day long. Read a book, look at the pictures, <laughs> find out what, you know, what, get critiques from other professionals. That's what I would say is, is if you were starting out in architectural photography, I would uh, put together whatever portfolio you could muster and go to somebody that's been around the block. Excellent. I, I probably, appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And probably somebody who you admire too, mm -hmm. like their style, and then show them what your what uh what your current state is. And, I think and that's get, great. And get feedback. Yeah, that's that's great. Um I'm sure people approach you and people do me as well as, as you know, can I come and assist you and uh <laughs> Or can I shoot for you? That kind yeah. of thing. But there seems to be um, kind of a, an illiteracy about the art of photography. And um, I, I don't know if it's not being taught. Um, I think there's plenty of resources out there. But uh, like you said, studying those who, who do it very well and have done it very well over the years seems to be such an integral part because I find myself, and I'm sure you've experienced this, where you'll be on a shoot and something reminds you of something you've seen. You know, you approach a shot and you think, well, I could do it something like this because it reminds me of, of uh, you know, the shot that I saw uh, Edward Weston do or somebody like that, you know, that it, it, it kind of evokes that same compositional value. And, but if you don't have that vocabulary, then you don't have that to draw from. Brian, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. I've learned a lot from you and uh, we really appreciate having somebody of your talent and background and professionalism in the AIAP. And uh, yeah, it's been a real pleasure. I'm sure that this podcast is going to be of great value to a lot of people. And uh, I think it's very generous of you to to take the time to speak with us today. Again, well, I'm just thanks. honored to be uh, <laughs> to do it. Thank you so much, Alan. It's, uh, Thank you. It has been a pleasure, and I uh, appreciate everything you do for our uh, little niche of uh, <laughs> still photography. Um, I will have your information, um, the description of the podcast and the video that uh, once they post to YouTube, and then both uh, the podcasts are available on all of the general podcast channels now. So I will have links to your website and uh, a little bit of bio information in there as well. Again, thanks to Brian Dressler Fantastic. for joining us today. We'll uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Alan. Take care.